I'm going to assume that you've already heard of Blur and know that it's one of the most underrated games of the seventh generation. You might also know that it was created by the same studio that made MSR and the Project Gotham games. What you might not know is that Bizarre Creations had been around for about 20 years before they made Blur, and along with making many top-tier racing games, they had a pretty diverse back catalogue. Blur wasn't entirely a product of their creation either. Publisher meddling and the pressure to deliver a bestseller heavily influenced the final game. It's a fascinating mashup of licensed car porn and arcadey kart racer inspired mechanics. It's a style of mainstream racing game that hadn't been seen before and hasn't been seen since. On paper it sounds like two genres that shouldn't coexist, but somehow this unorthodox blend works. It doesn't just work either, it's freaking excellent. So in this retro review, I'm going to take a look at its plague development history, its underwhelming launch, how the different versions compare, and what it's like to play today. So sit back, strap your seatbelts on, this is Blur. Blur was far from Bizarre Creations' first attempt at a racing game. The studio had created plenty of popular races over the years. It wasn't just racing games that they were skilled at making though. Their back catalogue includes many well-received titles, such as Geometry Wars for the 360, Wiz and Liz for the Amiga and Mega Drive, and Fur Fighters for the Dreamcast and PS2. This was a studio that had a lot of experience across a broad range of genres. Bizarre Creations was purchased by Activision in 2007, shortly after they had shipped the fourth and final Project Gotham game. Activision was keen to get a AAA racing game in their portfolio, which up until that point had consisted mostly of kart races. The extremely beige Supercar Street Challenge was one of just a handful of serious racing games that they'd published. Development on Blur started soon after the acquisition, and would be the first of only two games that Bizarre Creations would produce for Activision. The team initially set out to make a racing game that would be both fun to play and provide new experiences. Having spent the last seven years focused on serious racing titles, they were keen to explore different types of gameplay. Their goal with Blur was to provide constant battling, constant chaos, constant overtaking and a constant jostling for position. The original solution to achieve this was simply to add more cars on the track. Blur features up to 20 cars in total, which was miles ahead of most other racing games at the time. This alone apparently didn't deliver the level of excitement they were aiming for, so they tested a number of ideas before landing on power-ups. This provided the desired amount of battling, chaos and overtaking they had originally envisioned. The choice to use licensed cars over fictional vehicles was apparently to appeal to a mature audience. It was also felt that real cars would give the game a triple A layer of quality. And this is one of the many signs that certain elements of the game's design had been influenced by outside opinions. The original 2009 release date was pushed back by six months into mid-2010 by Activision, so that they could, quote, give the development team more time to enhance the game's innovative and distinctive online multiplayer. One of these innovations was the ability to share challenges and progress updates via social media. Interviews with studio heads at launch painted a harmonious picture of the game's development. The story at the time was that Activision's input was minimal, and that the studio had been given full creative control to make whatever game they liked. The only request Activision had was that they make a broadly appealing racing game. In reality, Activision's overbearing influence and demands derailed the studio's original vision. An interview with Bizarre Creations' former commercial director Sarah Chudley, after the studio had been shut down, revealed how Activision had completely disregarded their creative process and expertise. It's unclear what the game might have turned out like if Bizarre Creations had been allowed to execute their original vision. What is clear is that despite Activision's involvement, they still managed to make an incredibly entertaining racing game. The game would eventually launch in May of 2010, to largely positive reviews from both critics and players alike. However, as you already know, it didn't sell. In fact, Blur was an astronomic flop at launch, selling a tiny 31,000 copies in the first five days in North America. It would eventually go on to sell 500,000 copies in total, but this was a far cry from what other racing games that came out that year would sell, such as the 5 million copies that Need for Speed Hot Pursuit sold, or the 6 million copies that Gran Turismo 5 would sell. Now, I'm not going to go into detail about why it failed. I covered this in my split-second review, and many of the reasons for both games having disappointing sales are the same. 
The abridged version is that 2010 was an incredibly competitive year for the racing genre. Additionally, Blur's positioning was, well, kind of blurry. It wasn't a sim racer, but it had licensed cars, and it didn't look like a kart racer, but it had power-ups. It wasn't immediately clear what this game was or who it was for. The marketing also didn't do it any favours. In the end, the poor financial success of both Blur and Bizarre Creation's final game, 007 Bloodstone, was enough for Activision to close the studio after they failed to find a buyer. Strange design choices and broken features don't hold Blur back from being a fast, explosive and highly compelling racing game. The Mario Kart comparison is a cliché at this point, but aside from the power-ups, its core gameplay is very different to kart races. Firstly, power-ups aren't random. You find the same ones in the same locations on every lap, which means that you can decide what to pick up, and sometimes you'll have to choose a specific power-up over taking your preferred route. Secondly, you can hold up to three power-ups at any time, and switch between them to use the right one for the right moment. This adds a layer of strategy to the proceedings that you don't get with many other kart races. Adding additional complexity to this is that you can add a mod to one of these power-ups, allowing you to buff a specific ability. This is a nice enough feature when playing the campaign, but when you have a couple of mates gathered around the TV with you, it's a concept that's kind of hard to explain, particularly after a few beers. And this is one of the few issues I have with Blur's design. So, let me explain. A major draw of kart races is their ability to cater to every skill level. Whether you have 100 hours in the game or just one, races can be won by anyone. Blur isn't like this. The effect that power-ups have on every race is very much like any other kart racer. They can quickly shuffle the order of the pack, but unlike other kart races, the lack of random power-ups makes the racing, well, less random. There's also no blue shell or other type of equalizer for those running at the back of the pack. If you fall behind, it's completely up to you to catch back up. Non-random power-up placement requires that you think about what power-ups you want to get and then place your car on the right part of the track to pick them up. Blur demands planning, track knowledge and skill in order to maximise the use of power-ups, and more experienced players have a pretty big advantage. Above all else though, your skill behind the wheel determines where you place. Sure, you need to be able to dodge incoming attacks and grab the right power-up, but if you don't know how to hit an apex correctly or step the rear out of the car you're driving, then you'll be left in the dust. The drift mechanic, for example, is quite nuanced. This isn't like other arcade races, where you can barrel into a corner, slam on the brakes, and then punch the throttle for a godly power slide. Even the very drifty cars need a deft touch to unsettle the rear end just enough to go sideways without losing too much speed. The learning curve is a little steep, but the net result is that when you nail it, it feels orgasmic. Car handling is arcadey, but it's more grounded than something like Split Second. I've seen some people suggest that Blur is basically just Project Gotham with power-ups, and I'm telling you, this isn't anything like Project Gotham, not even close. There are four categories of cars that are essentially separated by speed. Within each class, you have six subcategories. Drifty, very drifty, grippy, very grippy, balanced and off-road. There's a ton of diversity within each class, from sleek supercars to wacky stuff the devs made up. There's even a racing van. It's not the Renault Espace, but it's still awesome to drive. And just listen to it. Each car feels distinct and there's an excellent sensation of speed, even in the lowest class of vehicles. The different track surfaces and configurations suit some subcategories better than others. For example, the twisty turns of the Tokyo track demand cars with high grip and acceleration, whereas the beachfront track of Brighton caters to the off-road vehicles. This variety of track surface means that there are a lot of viable vehicles within each class. Most tracks have a number of routes too, again, some of which suit certain vehicles better than others. It would have been cool if they had lent into this concept further, because there isn't a huge penalty for using the wrong vehicle on certain parts of the track. The other issue is that once you unlock the top tier vehicles, there isn't much incentive for using anything else. There are a few top tier choices within each class though, so it's not like some other games where there's one car to rule them all. Rubber banding isn't an issue either. Even with the one-on-one -on -one races, it's possible to pull out a big lead. That's not to say it's an easy game. Some of the chapter criteria can be quite challenging to complete. It never feels impossible or cheap though. 
The biggest problem with Activision's push for Blur to be a multiplayer focused experience is that in 2022 it's not easy finding a game. On PC there is a community of enthusiasts playing a modded version of the game, but on console you're probably going to be sitting in an empty lobby. Thankfully, not only does Blur have local 4 player split screen, it looks and runs great too. You can even have AI rivals. You can system link as well for some good old fashioned LAN party action. It's a shame that not many modern games consider a future where online multiplayer isn't possible due to either a lack of players or the servers being shut down. Blur is an excellent example of the importance of local multiplayer. Ultimately though, regardless of how you choose to play, races deliver on the promise of being fast, fun and chaotic. Each chapter comprises a variety of different events, including races, checkpoint events, destruction events and one-on-ones. Each of these awards you with fan points, which are basically your experience points. The more points you have, the more cars and events you unlock. Fan points can also be earned by completing various in-race tasks, such as driving through gates or attacking rivals with a specific power-up. In addition to this, each chapter has a unique list of requirements that needs to be completed. When you complete this list, you unlock a special car and the boss challenge. Beating the boss awards you with their vehicle, which is essentially just a less attractive version of the car you just unlocked. More importantly though, beating the boss unlocks a power-up mod, of which there are 8 to collect. Completing each chapter's requirements gives you an excellent reason to go back and retry previous events. It's also just fun to try a previous race with a new car, and overall the replayability here is high. I don't know about you, but I hate story modes in racing games. I don't care about what's going on or how badass your rivals are, I'm here to go racing, period. Thankfully, Blur's story is minimal. Actually, outside of the brief introductions to each chapter and the boss battles, it doesn't really have a story. It still has the typical mid-2000s Fast and Furious vibe, but yeah, Blur is about the gameplay and not much else. Based on a discovery by some curious folk digging around in a beta version of the game, it looks like the campaign was originally going to have a much more fleshed out story. A large number of cutscenes were discovered that had been removed from the game prior to launch. It's unclear exactly why these scenes were removed, but a popular belief is that Activision's desire to push the multiplayer component over the story seems to line up with other reports about their influence on the game. Outside of the campaign and multiplayer, there's not a great deal to do. There's a showroom to check out your cars, a photo mode, achievements, leaderboards and options. The options have some pretty comprehensive sound settings, including the ability to turn off the licensed soundtrack, which is great if you're making YouTube content. The front end looks slick. It's fast, intuitive and there are some thoughtful quality of life features, like how you can quickly change your vehicle when retrying an event. It's actually very similar in appearance and operation to Split Seconds UI. This style of card-based UI was super popular at the time, so it's not really that surprising. The similarities don't just stop at the UI though. The structure and type of events are also comparable, and the placement of the UI behind vehicles and their function are basically the same. Even some of the track design looks alike. You might be thinking then that these two games are interchangeable, but when it comes to gameplay, they actually share very little in common. A game of Blur doesn't feel like a game of Split Second any more than a race in Forza feels like a race in Forza Horizon. Visually, the game holds up well. There are heaps of flashy visual effects such as the explosions that flip cars into the air and the light trails left when a power-up is used. Car models and tracks are detailed for the era and by and large the game is stylishly presented. I was a little disappointed that there's only a third person view and a bumper cam. A cockpit or bonnet cam like the ones in Project Gotham Racing would have been incredible. On the audio front, things are equally impressive. I find that car engine noises in racing games from this era are really hit and miss. Blur isn't top of the class, but it also doesn't leave you wanting. The soundtrack comprises of a combination of original and licensed tracks, and features a number of electronic artists including The Herbalizer, The Crystal Method and Cold Cut. I find that soundtracks that use licensed music tend to feel dated, and thankfully the decision to use both original tracks as well as tracks from less well-known artists has meant that that's not the case here, for now at least anyway. When it comes to which platform to play it on, PC is easily the most impressive. Here you can expect a 1080p resolution at 60 frames per second, whereas the console versions look a bit muddier at 720p running at 30 frames per second. The version you've been watching here is the Xbox 360, which is what this review is based on. On close inspection, it is starting to show its age, but during the action most of the rough edges fade into the background. 
If you're trying to choose between the PS3 and 360 versions, there's not a huge difference between them. The Xbox version does look slightly sharper due to the anti-aliasing technique used, but you'd have to break out the magnifying glass to pick the two apart. Performance is very solid on both machines, and although there is occasional screen tearing, it's barely noticeable with all the other effects and cars on the screen. As usual, the PS3 does have better audio options, supporting Dolby Digital, DTS, 5.1 Linear PCM, and 7.1 Linear PCM. So for those of you with fancy systems or headphones, this might be the way to go on console. Even without online features, Blur remains an excellent and unique arcade racer. The racing is fun whether you play against the AI or against your friends on the couch. It's extremely frustrating that it didn't perform better from a sales point of view and that the studio that created it has been disbanded. There was huge potential for a sequel, which actually had started development but was obviously cancelled. You could say that, along with Split Second, Blur is a swan song for a genre that used to dominate the sales charts. AAA studios simply don't make games like this anymore, leaving it up to smaller studios and indie developers to take the mantle. There have been a number of good titles coming from these smaller studios, but what I wouldn't give for a brand new AAA arcade combat racer. If you can track down a copy of Blur, I'd suggest doing so because it's still very much worth your time. If you like this video, why not drop me a like, and conversely, a dislike if you didn't. If you want to support the channel and find out more about how I make these videos, check out the Patreon. If you're new around here and want to stay up to date with all my content, hit that subscribe button. But otherwise, thanks for watching.